Well, good evening. Welcome to our at the table service tonight here at Western Boulevard uh, on this, the 14th of August, uh, 2022. It's a great to have you with us. And if you're watching us on a recording, we're glad you're joining us um, for this time of worship uh, in this interactive way. We hope you find God's presence and God's love uh, as a part of this service uh, tonight. Um, just a reminder that in a couple of Sundays, we're going to have a special uh, service uh, for the at the table service on August the 28th. It'll be our jazz Vespers service and our own Van Anthony Hall is going to be leading being a, a key part of that. Um, and do you want to say anything specific about that for folks to know, give a little teaser about that? Oh, sure. Um, we have, have planned uh, some prayer music uh, based on the poetry of County Cullen. The particular poet, uh, poem is titled uh, Any Human to Another. And uh, we'll have a little blurb, a little portion of that poem uh, in the next week or two um, as a sort of preliminary ad, if you will, or a trailer. <laughs> but uh, we would love to see every one of you, uh, if you can, in person. And so we can um, pray and praise uh, together in person and have a unified, uh, you know, I'm all about understanding vibrations and uh, so, yeah, the 28th, please come out. Thanks. And, and yeah, the service will be on August 28th. It'll be at the in the sanctuary at five o'clock. Um, and if, for, if you're not able to join us in person, know that our, our intent is to record that service and to put the recording up on our YouTube page, just like we do our normal at the table service. So it's available to all, whether it's that evening or um, or later on. But it's a, looking forward to that and, and hope you can join us for that special time. But why don't yeah. we go ahead and go ahead and begin our service uh, tonight. Let me put up here on the screen um, our responsive call to worship and invite you to join me in that. Our soul waits for the Lord, who is our help and our shield. Our hearts are glad because we trust in God's holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. We come with hearts full of gratitude to worship our God. And Anthony, I'll invite you to lead us in music. This song is titled Lord You're Welcome. I love this song uh, in person and even, I love it even more now that we're worshiping we're not in person. Uh, to borrow from uh, a good friend of ours, uh, Reverend Dr. Bruce Grady, I want you to imagine that this place that we're in is still a place, right? And so we ask the Lord or we invoke the Lord and say, you're welcome into this holy place. And even though this place is digital, uh, and so I borrow some vocabulary from Bruce, I want you and your sanctified imagination believe that this place is also our hearts and, and our minds, right? We invoke and welcome the Lord in that place. Amen. Lord, you're welcome into this holy place. Lord, you're welcome into this house of praise. Lord, you're righteous, glorious, worthy of all praise. Lord, you're welcome into this holy place. Lord, you're welcome into this holy place. Lord, you're welcome into this house of praise. Lord, you're righteous, glorious, worthy of all. Lord, you're righteous, glorious, worthy of all praise. Lord, you're righteous, glorious, worthy of all praise. Lord, you're welcome into this holy place. Amen. 
Lord, you are welcome here. Our scripture today um, comes from the letter to the Hebrews, and I invite you to hear these words from the New Testament. By faith, the people pass through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fires, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better so that they would not without us be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. May God add a blessing to the reading of God's word this day. Have you ever been a stranger in a foreign land? There have been many times in my life when I've visited other countries for a short time, or I've lived overseas for an extended time when I definitely felt like a stranger. When I didn't know the language, I struggled to interpret signs or menus or directions that were being given to me by local residents. I remember feeling very, very grateful that Debbie, my wife, was fluent in German because that got, out of, got us out of many a pickle when we were traveling in continental Europe. But when I've been in places like India or Mexico, I was heavily dependent on our guides for those trips. And I remember feeling very anxious whenever I had to communicate on my own. Being such a stranger or alien, as our popular culture has taken to calling others, it's a startling experience. You feel self-conscious because the clothes you wear are unlike what the majority of folks are wearing. You don't understand any of the native language and you feel overwhelmed trying to do very simple things like buying groceries or reading a bus schedule or finding a doctor. If you're on vacation or you're on a short trip, at least you know that this anxious feeling will end after a set amount of time. But if you're living outside your native land, your feelings of apprehension start to mount and grow every day that you remain an alien in a foreign land. Whenever I read the letters of Paul or the other New Testament letters, I'm drawn to this image of strangers in a foreign land. The churches Paul and others wrote to were little enclaves of Christianity surrounded by secular strife and persecution. 
those early Christians were not part of the established religion, which the world recognized as legitimate. Their native tongue of faith was far from what they heard around them in the marketplace or on the streets. They were persecuted and ostracized for believing in the word of God incarnate. And I have to believe that at some point they began to wonder if this gift of Christian faith was really worth all of their pain. And there are hints of this situation scattered throughout the letter to the Hebrews. The writer of this letter exhorts his readers to hold fast to our confession, to lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet and not to refuse the one who is speaking. One commentator describes this faith community as second generation believers, having been baptized and fully instructed. In fact, they had been believers long enough to have become teachers, but have been stunted in their growth. The readers are a faith community in crisis. Some members have grown lax in attendance at their assemblies and their commitment is waning. Even though the letter to the Hebrews is one of the most ambiguous books in the Bible because of we don't know exactly who wrote it, it clearly speaks to Christians who are struggling with how to live faithfully with so much pressure around them to follow other gods. In light of this anxiety and uncertainty, the writer of the letter reminds the readers of the great cloud of witnesses who have preceded them in faith. Last week, we read how the writer used Abraham and Sarah as examples of faithfulness, even when their awaited promise was not necessarily for them to witness. And today, our passage comes in the midst of the writer's listen, listing of numerous saints of the Hebrew scriptures who have been witnesses of God's grace. It's a who's who of characters, heroes of the faith who have followed the calling God placed in their hearts, and who remained faithful even in the midst of persecution and hardship. The writer speaks of the Israelites fleeing through the Red Sea, of the walls of Jericho falling by faith, and even of the prostitute Rahab's faithful action of welcoming the Israelites' spies of Joshua. Beverly Gaventa comments that in the verse 32, Instead of detailing the faithful deeds of individuals, the author lists them and refers more generally to their accomplishments. Initially, in verses 32 through 34, these are military or political deeds born of faithfulness, conquering of other nations, ruling with justice, triumphs in war. At verse 35, though, the subject changes. Instead of celebrating the triumphs of Israel, verses 35 through 38 recount the faithfulness of the martyrs during the Maccabean period. Faithfulness consists not only of the triumphal behavior in battle and conquest, but also of the faithful endurance of persecution. And at the end of this listing of all the faithful saints, we have a similar closing as what we read last Sunday. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. The first half of that quote echoes what we heard last week. These faithful saints did not yet know what would happen, but they believed that God would provide. And in the second half of that quote, we see the foretelling of God's promise. Even these heroes and heroines of Israel's past did not attain the full victory for their faith because something better had been promised them. And that something now appears in the person and work of Jesus Christ. What's powerful about this passage is the crescendo which builds throughout that listing of Israel's heroes in the faith. This crescendo moves throughout the Old Testament until we reach the promise of God's perfection, Jesus Christ. But you'll notice it's not 
some bland statement about believing in God's Son. It's an active, realistic, inspiring description of what the journey of faith is all about. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Let us also lay aside every weight that and the sin which clings so closely. The writer knows that his readers' lives are not smooth and easy. They are running races which are full of ups and downs, and they are weighed down by all the stresses and temptations which seek to divert them from their path. This journey is not easy. It is hard. It is difficult. But it is not impossible. That is why we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses the, to that is why we are called to look to Jesus as the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. He is the one who endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Saintly living doesn't mean you have to be perfect. There is one and only one who is called to be the perfecter of our faith. Saintly living means you remember the presence of God throughout all of time and space, and how God's presence has led so many witnesses throughout that time. Saintly living doesn't require perfection. Saintly living requires assurance and perseverance and faith. The other thing that I've reflected on this week as it relates to this passage is how we're all called to be saints to others. We probably don't like to use the word saint when we describe ourselves, but in a lot of ways, how we care for others, how we lead others, and how we serve others in Christ's name is a form of saintly living. Early in my life, I was the beneficiary of much saintly wisdom I was on the receiving end of the mentor-mentee relationship, whether it had to do with ministry or marriage or parenting or anything else. And I realized how valuable that was to my formation as a child of God. And I look forward to the day in the future when an opportunity would present itself for me to pay it forward. And now... It feels as if that time has arrived in my life, whether it's seeking to guide discussions with a board or offering personal encouragement to a young pastor or to offer counsel to a student or to be a listening ear to a young believer. I've been placed in those opportunities for growth and deepening faith, but I haven't been in those relationships or opportunities on my own. The cloud of witnesses has surrounded me with memories of challenging times in my past and with the encouragement I receive through God from those saints. While I'm seeking to live faithfully today, I trust that it is with the formation I received from the saints in my past. And I pray I will influence in a saintly way those who will come after me. One of the things that has impacted me the most about this congregation has been the impact saints have had in mentoring and forming the faith of others. I've witnessed it in the long history of adults mentoring children and youth on mission trips, in Sunday school, in scouts, or through other church activities. I've heard it in the stories that you have told about generations of the past who taught you, who corrected you, and who formed you in, into the disciples of Christ you are today. I've witnessed it in the risks you have been willing to take to show love to the outcast and to the downtrodden, and how those decisions were guided by the lessons of faith you were taught by the saints who went before you. And that gives me hope for the future. 
And I pray it gives you hope as well. For even though we have saints from our lives who have died, that doesn't mean they are gone forever. For they are our great assurance in what lies ahead. When a member of the church is diagnosed with cancer, do you hear comfort from the cloud of witnesses saying, have faith and know that God will be with you? When the church struggles with conflict or unrest or discernment, do you hear the encouragement from the cloud of witnesses saying, trust in the Lord and God will show you the way? When you are wrestling with life's stresses and anxieties, and you feel you can't go on another day on this race that is before you? Do you hear the peace from the cloud of witnesses saying, believe that God is here and God will never abandon you? God was there. God is here. God will always be with you. Trust in the one who is the perfecter of our faith and believe that the cloud of witnesses are surrounding us with God's grace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let us affirm our faith by declaring our faith using the words from Psalm 80, which you'll see there on your screen. Let's say together our declaration of faith. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. For our prayers of the people today, our time of sharing, I thought we might try something a little different today, if you guys don't mind. Um, that instead of sharing joys and concerns at the beginning and then let me offering a prayer, I thought maybe just as a time of prayer that I would start with a, a brief opening and then just we can just share petitions and, and requests, whether they be joys or concerns. And after each of us have shared one, that we simply say, Lord, in your mercy, and then we respond, hear our prayers. Um, so let's, why don't I start? And I've got, I've got a few that I'll share, but, but I would invite you just to unmute yourself when it's time. And, and just to speak up, and then I'll lead us, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. So let's turn to God. In. Loving and holy God, we know that we can always come to you grateful for your presence and your spirit. And we are grateful for the cloud of witnesses that surround us today and live in your kingdom eternally. May they be our strength, just as your son is our strength to know that we're never alone and you are always with us. And we lift up today our prayers to you. We remember the family of Kenny Stott, who continues to mourn his death as we celebrated his life this past week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We lift up to you, <clears throat> to you, O oh Lord. When Aurelio, as, as she uh, starts a new, a new series of treatments to try to counteract her cancer that has spread, Lord, in your mercy, hear our hear prayers. prayers. We lift up to you, Holy One, my cousin Chris Farley, seeing a heart transplant specialist tomorrow in New Orleans. May your will be done and may we take joy in your will, whatever your will may be. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. I'd like to lift up a friend of mine, 
um, who had a vein in cancer and her chemo treatment has not worked. So I would like to lift up prayers for her. Lord, in your mercy. Our prayers. prayers. Lord, we remember members of the law enforcement community today, as we have seen two deputies in our community shot and killed in the line of duty. And we remember their families and their colleagues. And we ask, oh Lord, that you would work in a way that would change people's mindsets, change people's actions, so that gun violence would be reduced. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. So I would just ask prayers for energy and guided excitement as we get ready to kick off another church year with Christian ed and youth groups and fellowship opportunities that um, the people responsible for all that programming and have the energy to keep on keeping on. Lord in, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. And I would offer to that as well, lift up our young adults, those who are out of high school, those who are preparing perhaps to go back to college or go to college for the first time, be with them and their families as they enter into this next stage of life. And may your loving kindness always be with them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord, I offer a prayer of thanksgiving for safe travels, getting Van Anthony back home and our youth group uh, back home from a good um, We thank you for your traveling mercies. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Loving God, we offer all of these in the strong name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Bain Anthony, I'll turn it over to you. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. The Lord works and waits we cannot see he will make a way for me God will be my guide hold me closely to the side of love and strength for each new day the Lord will make
friends know as you walk and you, well, as you walk and run this race that is set before you, know that you do not get, do it alone, that the cloud of witnesses is with you, just as God's love in Jesus Christ is with you, he will strengthen you and guide you along the way. God's love be with you now and always. Amen. Friends, have a wonderful week. Be safe. Take care. I hope to see you next Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Have a good week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Miss you all. Miss you all very much. We miss you too.